Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we are going over DKA. You will see it often, so I want to prepare you ahead of time. We will be discussing what it is, patient presentation, the workup, management, specifically going over fluids, insulin therapy, and electrolyte replacement, as well as going over why we try to avoid intubating patients in DKA, cerebral edema, and why bicarb is not typically given for patients in DKA. Then, of course, we are going to finish with nursing-specific tips and the question of the day. Bottom line, DKA is a metabolic emergency as patients will end up in shock and ultimately die without any interventions. Typically, there is no or very minimal insulin, which leads to very high levels of blood sugar as cells cannot utilize glucose for energy. So cells turn to breaking down fat for energy, leading to the production of ketones as a byproduct. Because ketones are naturally acidic, metabolic acidosis ensures. As a result of the high blood sugar, osmotic diuresis also occurs meaning patients pee and pee ultimately becoming very dehydrated so this dehydration combined with, with diuresis and acidosis from the ketones then lead the patient to severe electrolyte abnormalities and ultimately if nothing is done for your patient shock and death occur it's most common in type 1 diabetics however it also commonly occurs in types 2 diabetics know that for type 1, DKA is most often the first onset or the first sign of a patient having diabetes. And for type 2s, a stressor such as an infection can send the patient into DKA. Now let's go over presentation. Your patient will most likely present with abdominal discomfort, often feeling nauseous as a result of their met metabolic acidosis. They'll report being increasingly tired as their cells haven't been able to use glucose for energy. Of course, they can present with classic symptoms of increased urination and increased thirst, which as we discussed are as a result of osmotic diuresis in the body attempting to compensate by drinking more water. They will be dry and or in other words, very dehydrated. If severe enough, they will also exhibit cool small respirations which are deep, rapid breaths in an attempt to compensate for metabolic acidosis by breathing out CO2. And ultimately, they will be tachycardic and hypotensive with a very high blood sugar. Now, for the workup, or in other words, what is going to be ordered, let's talk about those. So to start things off, we need to figure out what led the patient to developing DKA. Is it new onset type 1 diabetes or did an infection throw everything out of whack and the patient is now in DKA? Did the patient not take their insulin as prescribed or was it a different stressor like pregnancy, pancreatitis, trauma, a thyroid issue perhaps? The list goes on. Was it a different stressor than the things we talked about? Of course, you're going to check the blood sugar via point of care with the glucometer and then off the basic metabolic panel. Know that perhaps one of the most important lab values for DKA is BHB or beta hydroxybutyrate, which to keep it simple is a ketone body that is made in periods of starvation as cells can use it for energy. And in DKA, when the BHB is elevated, it signals the presence of ketones in the body. BHB is very important in helping providers diagnose and figure out the severity of DKA as the higher it is, the worse the DKA is. Continuing on, a VBG may also be ordered, which results quickly and can give us important information like a rough value for electrolytes and the patient's pH, as well as a lactate, which if elevated signals hypoperfusion. A CBC is useful as well as it can help us figure out if an infection is present as well as other triggers like anemia. A basic metabolic panel will give us electrolytes, specific lab values related to organ systems, the bicarb, and will allow us to calculate the patient's gap, which we are talking about on the next slide, so stick around for that.
A urinalysis can help with detecting ketones and for infection in the urine, as well as other things. And finally, if an infection is suspected, blood cultures and urine cultures can be ordered. And to further look for infectious sources, an abdominal CT and a chest x-ray may be ordered. Now, let's get into the gap. The body likes to keep an acid-base balance to be in homeostasis. And we know that there are anions and cations, with anions being negative and cations being positive. So the gap is simply the difference between these cations and these anions. So when there is a high anion gap, it means there are a lot more of these anions than there typically is. So in DKA specifically, since the ketones are an anion, they are very acidic, which is why DKA patients are said to be in a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. The formula to calculate the gap is sodium minus chloride minus bicarb, knowing that the sodium is a cation while chloride and bicarb are anions. So in homeostasis or when there is an acid-base balance, this formula is going to give you a number that is less than 12. However, in DKA, since ketones are an anion, the formula will yield a number that is higher than 12, which is when people will say that there is a high anion gap. Now, we check the gap every four hours while a patient is on an insulin drip to assess if the gap is closing, or in other words, if it's decreasing or closing, it simply tells us that the issue with the ketones is beginning to resolve. One important thing to keep track of when calculating the gap is that the CO2 lab value in the basic metabolic panel will be used as a substitute for the bicarb in the formula. We are gonna cover the treatment modalities in detail on the next slides, but I quickly want to go over them as a whole. The treatment of DKA will be based around treating the underlying illness if there is one, on volume, resuscitating your patients with fluids, on giving insulin, on and on replacing electrolytes. These four things need to happen in order to treat your DKA patients. So now let's get into the specifics of the treatment. Typically, to volume resuscitate your patient, you're going to give one or two liters of a crystalloid over one hour. Then you will reevaluate to determine if more fluids are needed as a bolus. Fluids are very important because if you remember, your patients will be very dry and dehydrated, often borderline in shock. And we want to resuscitate early to prevent all the bad stuff associated with shock. You are going to recheck your patient's blood sugar after giving the initial fluids to assess what kind of impact it had on the patient's blood sugar. I've had patients with blood sugar drop tons in the past, and if I would have started the insulin drip without rechecking it after the fluid, I would have got myself in trouble. Then, note that after the initial boluses, the patient will be started on some type of fluid infusion. So, with insulin, the most important is to know that the only insulin that can go IV is regular insulin. Again, the only insulin that can go IV is regular insulin. Before starting the insulin drip, you must have a potassium level because as you remember, insulin drives potassium into the cell. So if your patient's potassium is already low and you give insulin, you can make it even lower which as we know, a low potassium predisposes patients for deadly cardiac arrhythmias. Each facility will have a protocol for adjusting the rate of the insulin drip, depending on how much the blood sugar is dropping while on the insulin drip. So please follow your hospital's policies and protocol to the dot. Of course, do it with your preset so that you're doing it correctly. Know that while your patient is on the insulin drip, you will be checking the blood sugar every single hour on the dot in order to adjust the rate of the insulin drip depending on the results. You will also draw and check a basic metabolic panel every four hours, as we discuss, in order to assess your patient's gap. 
and to ensure that you are keeping track of electrolytes especially potassium is it going down is it going up what's going on right you will also have an order for a fluid infusion throughout however once your blood sugar gets down to 250 while the patient is on the insulin drip you will be changing the fluids to d5 half an s with or without potassium inside the fluids depending on the patient's potassium level you change it to d5 half an s in order to give your patients some glucose to prevent them from going hypoglycemic so just because the blood sugar is going down and correcting it doesn't mean that the ketones issue is resolving which is why patients still remain on the insulin drip and why we check the gap every four hours remember it's because the ketones are the ones that are causing all these negative effects on the patient so the patient can still remain on the insulin drip even if the blood sugar has gone down and they'll remain on the insulin until the ketones issue is resolved and we'll know that it's resolved by checking the gap every four hours and once it closes once that formula yields a number less than 12 and we're going to we're going to talk about when to stop an insulin drip on a later slide so now let's get into talking about replacing potassium. If the potassium level is less than 3.3, you cannot start the insulin drip. So it's very important to know how to replace it. I'm sure you've heard of this before, but never ever push potassium IV. You'll send your patient into a deadly cardiac rhythm. So in order to replace it safely, we can give 10 MEQ of potassium per hour peripherally and up to 20 MEQ of potassium per hour if it's through a central line. These rates are there for safety, but also because a patient but also because potassium can be very irritating to veins and if done faster it can cause severe pain especially through peripheral lines. You can give up to 40 MEQ by mouth. Know that it is also going to be irritating to the stomach and the pills are usually very big. So, besides potassium, you're also going to be replacing other electrolytes. But I want to mention magnesium specifically because it helps maintain potassium levels normal when it itself is within normal limits. Of course, at the end, you have to treat the underlying illness, which is commonly going to be an infection. And as far as infections, the most common ones are going to be a UTI or pneumonia. So you may be asking yourself, if the patient is acidotic, why don't we just give bicarb or put him on a bicarb drip well that's a good question but giving bicarb won't solve the underlying issue of there being a bunch of ketones everywhere what's important is the fluids in the insulin to solve the ketoacidosis do note that bicarb is sometimes given if the ph is less than 6.9 or if the patient has a super high potassium since bicarb is part of the hyperkalemia treatment regimen now what about cerebral edema i know we were taught in nursing school that if we drop the blood sugar too fast it can lead to it well yes which is why we have the protocol to strictly follow since our goal is to drop the blood sugar by 50 to 70 per hour however it is very rare in adults you mainly worry about cerebral edema with pediatric patients so keep that in mind so now what about intubation why do we try and avoid intubating dka patients well simply because in dka patients they breathe very rapidly and deeply as a compensatory mechanism for the metabolic acidosis in order to exhale the co2 so if we intubate them we usually can't match the tidal volumes or the breathing rate the patient has with the ventilator so if we do intubate them, we send them into a worsening acidosis because they're not compensating anymore. And as you know, acidosis shuts everything down and you would essentially be killing your patient if you do it. So when do we stop the insulin drip? A few key things need to happen before you stop the drip. The gap needs to be less than 12. So that formula we talked about needs to yield a number that is less than 12, which indicates a resolution of the ketoacidosis. The bicarb needs to be above 18 because if it's not, your patient could very easily go back into metabolic acidosis again. And the patient must be able to tolerate PO. So meaning that they can eat instead of being on the d5 right 
when the drip is going to be stopped this is very important and a long acting insulin is going to be ordered and you must give it two hours prior to stopping the insulin drip this is so that you give it enough time to start kicking in so you give this long acting insulin enough time to start kicking in because if you don't you're just gonna cold turkey your patient from insulin which without insulin they could go back into dk super easily right now let's get into some nursing specific tips and things that i want to mention insulins are very very dangerous you can easily kill somebody if you're not careful with them so always always have another nurse perform a double verification when you are starting and titrating insulin just to make sure that you stay safe and then early on i want you to place many ivs into your patient you'll be giving a variety of things including fluids the insulin drips replacing electrolytes and if needed antibiotics so you want to have at least two ivs so the patient gets everything in a timely manner potassium also can be very irritating to veins as i talked about so if it's hurting your patient you can slow the rate down or dilute it by running a compatible fluid through the same line or giving payments just talk to your provider so you can coordinate having the appropriate orders right and then if your patient is altered place them within your view because the last thing you need is for them to try and get out of bed and fall while still being connected on all of your lines Alrighty, now let's get into the question of the day what are the most commonly damaged organs in blunt abdominal trauma as always the answer is going to be at the bottom of the description text i think that being a good er nurse depends a lot on your experiences and taking the time to look up and familiarize yourself with topics that you don't fully understand I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description and I believe you can greatly benefit from them as well. Always, always keep learning. You'll be a better nurse, you'll be safer, and ultimately you'll be able to save more lives. If you enjoyed and learned something from the content today, I would really appreciate a like and a follow. And if anything comes to mind that you would like me to cover, please comment below. And also, if you want to support further i have stickers and shirts up on redbubble for er nurses check them out if you want to further support and then as always as always teamwork in the er makes the dream work and here at emergency chaos we are proactive we are not reactive thank you for your time today